looking for my phone, so I wasn't able to do my live, but that's okay. Oh. It's recorded, so I'll let people yeah. know. Mm -hmm. Well, good evening. We want to welcome you to In the Blender with Brandon and Madeline Hyman. And I tell you guys, we are so excited to be back live with you on this evening. I tell you, you are in for such a treat on tonight. So listen, you want to make sure that you grab a pen, a piece of paper, because there's going to be some very interesting things that we're going to share with you guys tonight that's going to change your life for the better. I tell you, we got a special guest, Dr. Yolanda Lewis Raglan. Yay! Yay. <laughs> this is phenomenal. I'm telling you guys, she's been assisting me um, over about two or three years now in some areas of my life that has been taking me to another level, another dimension. But on tonight, I wanted to call on her to do something a little different. Uh, not different than what she does, but different as far as it relates to in the blender. I know a lot of most times when we share with you guys, it's just blended family topics and blended family issues. But tonight we wanted to do something a little special for you guys, especially during this time um, with this COVID-19 and all of this that's going on in the land. And so we wanted to make sure that in the blender with Brandon and Madeline Hyman will contribute to the betterment of people that's listening and viewing us worldwide. And so on tonight, we have, again, Dr. Yolanda Lewis Raglan, and we're going to be talking about mental health awareness, <laughs> mental health awareness. So Dr. Yolanda, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, these two are such a blessing, not only to um, my life and to our ministry at Spirit of Faith um, Christian Center, but obviously to you guys as listeners. Um, they have such hearts of gold and hearts for others. And it's just so exciting to watch them um, as they navigate through things in their own life. They share it so that others are successful in these areas. So I'm just so grateful for you guys. Um, and just honored to um, be asked to, to join you today. Um, so my name is Yolanda Lewis Raglan. I am a physician. I'm, I'm board certified um, in both pediatrics um, as well as bariatrics. So I'm double board certified. Um, so I work with uh, both children and adults uh, when it comes to um, weight management, but also some addictive behaviors, which is really kind of uh, also associated with weight. Um, but that leads me into some of the areas of sort of um, mental health and mental health uh, awareness and issues. And so uh, it's kind of dear to my heart to talk about mental health. Um, and so I'm here today um, under that sort of umbrella because May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so uh, for me, it's extremely important um, that we call attention to mental health um, in our community. Um, and that we, you know, sort of talk about it and make sure that the conversation is open um, so that we, you know, sometimes we're operating in myths, we're operating, um, like one of the questions about stigmas, we just, we, we don't really know a lot. And so the things that we don't know a lot, sometimes we fear, and if we fear it, then we don't, um, we don't tackle it when we need to. So I'm very excited and, 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 ex and extremely um, proud that you all are um, tackling this this topic. Um, and, and, you know, it is important for families. I know you said it's a little different from um, blended families, but often um, it's really important to actually understand and explore mental health, uh, mental health issues, talking about how to, you know, how to open that conversation. If you think something maybe hasn't gone diagnosed or the fact that something is diagnosed and you're not sure if you're supposed to as a family member or a new family member, um, you know, be involved in that. So I think it's important for blended families, in fact, to understand mental health and know how to address it and figure out, you know, where they belong in the process of either diagnosis or treatment. And, you, and you know, it, it's, it's funny that you said that because I kind of I kind of get on my wife's nerves a lot because I'm always diagnosing things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, it's, and it's because I've dealt with a lot of issues, you know, in my childhood, in my young adults, as well as in my adulthood. And so because I've dealt with things and I really didn't have avenues 
worry about it, go and deal with them. I kind of like self healed myself, but mm -hmm. I was really like intrigued about mental health and the awareness of it and the stigmas and all those different things we're going to get into a little bit later. But to me, it's dear to my heart. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of relationships fail because of areas of mental health. Absolutely. And because yeah. we won't address those issues because, mm -hmm. you know, we won't really talk about them. We kind of sweep it under the rug or we just attribute it to it being that person. You know, a lot of people are really missing out on life to the fullness. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to take this opportunity this month to kind of highlight this area so that we could be a blessing to so many people that have really just not taken the opportunity or the time to really discuss this area. Right. Right. And so we thank you for uh, heeding the call. We thank you for mm -hmm. saying yes. I mean, if I didn't believe, you know, not just that you are qualified, but if I didn't believe myself from my observations and my dealing with you and how you even assisted me, even with the weight loss, because that, mm -hmm. that's a lot of mental health. That's a lot of mm -hmm. mental struggles and different things that I had to go through as far as eating disorders and things of that nature. And you've just assisted me so much in that area. And so I wanted people to get some of what I got. <laughs> so again, thank you so much for accepting uh, this opportunity and this call with us. Mm -hmm. And then you want to say? No, not at this moment. So I, I'm, I'm ready to jump right into this because I, I don't know if we're going to be able to cover everything on tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. so listen, guys, if while we're talking, if you have any questions yes. uh, that you want Dr. Yolanda to answer or you want to tackle, please type them in. So yes. We can let yes. her know um, and then we can jump right into it. Uh, there are some things we want to cover specifically, but if there are some things that you want to know, some questions that you may have, even while we're talking, feel free to jump right in. And so first, I just want to know, why is a mental health assessment necessary? So um, again, well, the point of an assessment is to kind of just find out where you are, where a person is when we talk about mental health and mental health assessments. The, the, the question is, when would you assess, I think, um, is probably most appropriate. Um, what I think a lot of people don't realize is that as youth, um, kind of what you were talking about earlier, many of us have experiences that shape our um, our lives, shape our reactions to things, um, shape just how we deal with things or how we don't deal with things, you know? And so there's a term that um, many of us as pediatricians know, um, and we, talk, we call them ACEs, and they're adverse childhood experiences, right? Or episodes. And so depending on how many adverse childhood experiences you've had will really determine um, how well you um, sort of navigate life as an adult. People really don't recognize that. And, and the other thing that's become more apparent is that uh, when you experience these ACEs, so adverse childhood experiences at a very young age, it actually can affect you physically. So there is a neurodevelopment that is um, impeded or um, just a malfunctioning of that neurodevelopment that can happen. So if a, if a, for instance, if a woman is highly stressed, say domestic violence, um, drug abuse, um, any of these like really stressful um, situations in her body, hormonally and enzymatically, um, her body is going to respond in a way that if she's pregnant, her actual fetus is going to experience a neural development malfunctioning um, that is, and, and it's very amazing because we're finding out on, on MRIs and all these studies that um, the cortex develops differently in a really highly um, stressed mother that a woman who has, you know, a, a normal pregnancy, you know, that's peaceful, you know, as far as it can be. And so that happens not only to a fetus, but it can happen actually as an infant, you know, and into toddlers as their brains are developing. We're just finding out that this may be connected to some of the ADHD, to some of the bipolar, to some of even the autism. There's all kinds of things that we're finding out 
that is um, connected to this neurodevelopment axis when it gets interrupted um, in the fetus as well as into toddler um, age. And we've never really addressed it. So when you talk about what is an adverse childhood experience, there's several things. Um, child abuse, uh, whether they experience child abuse of them, their, their own physical abuse, sexual abuse, mental, emotional abuse, whether they experience the abuse that they see from, you know, watching a, a parent be, um, you know, hurt or, you know, even murdered, you know, in front of them or, or a family member or someone in their neighborhood, right? Whether uh, you live in a very um, highly, uh, a, a, an environment that there's a lot of crime, um, whether there's a lot of tensions, whether there's poverty, um, alcoholism, um, there's so many adverse childhood experiences that many of us grow up and it's just like, you suck it up. It's a part of you know your neighborhood. It's a part of your community. And we've gone into this area where we sort of you know t talk about you know just being tough. That's how I grew up. That's how the hood is. Um, but we don't realize that it's truly affected how we operate as adults or how we tend to malfunction as adults. Um, and so, uh, you know, we found that there's some things that sort of protect against that. You may have a lot of childhood, um, adverse childhood experiences, but you may find that certain people that have some of the protections of it that are uh, kids who are in um, organizations, groups that give them um, positive feedback, if they have, um, if they become, you know, good at ath athletics, for instance, you might have somebody from these really bad experiences, but they get a lot of positive feedback because they're good at basketball or football or good dancer. Or good. And so some of these positive and, and, and experiences from coaches, um, from teachers and from peers can begin to offset that. But if you have this person who's had all these experiences and no one offset, you know, being able to give them anything positive to offset that, these are the kids that end up, and it's statistically known and shown, these are the kids that end up in our juvenile system, in our jails. And in our, and so, no, I'm, we're not trying to say there's an excuse for every, you know, for the things that, that, that they've done, but it doesn't come from just nowhere, usually, right? This, these are kids who have had their own micro aggressions, micro abuses, or even macro abuses and macro aggressions. Um, and it does affect how you um, mentally, you know, how you're able to operate within a classroom setting, uh, within order, you know, within a family, right? Within any setting that's supposed to have some kind of structure, you can have a really difficult time maintaining or operating within that structure because of that neural development access that is malfunctioned. So that's a, a, a long answer, but when we talk about mental health uh, assessments, um, we really want to know, you know, what are some of the things you're experiencing? How long have you been experiencing them? What does it keep you from doing? Um, are you unable to sleep? Um, does it affect the way that you, you know, does it affect your appetite? Does it affect your mood? What kind of moods do you have? Do you have mood swings? We want to assess where you are. And when do we do assessments? That's very dependent. It depends on, I mean, some people don't realize it, but they're getting um, mental health, emotional assessments on job interviews, you know, within when they're like filling out certain paperwork to work in certain places. If you want to work with children, if you want to work in certain settings, you know, some of these IQ tests or emotional um, um, quotient tests, EQ tests, some of them are really sort of testing your some mental health, you know, there. They want to know how healthy are you mentally, how healthy are you emotionally. Um, so those assessments are there. But when we do them in the medical field, it often is um, with someone who's had some sort of a uh, an episode, whether it was an outburst at school, uh, an outburst, um, uh, usually with kids, it's at school. Um, and most adults have probably been identified as a child or an adolescent uh, with whatever, anxiety or depression or bipolar or um, somewhere, one of, you know, one of those major um, ADHD, one of the major mental illnesses, um, we're usually OCD, um, 
most of the things that we would talk about, we would probably, uh, it would probably manifest itself, schizophrenia, things like that. They manifest themselves at least by uh, either as a child or young adulthood. And I want to start there because I found out that a lot of times when, when you talk about even the thought of an assessment, a lot of people feel like because they're quote unquote successful in their careers that, you know, well, I don't have those issues because I've, I've accomplished some things, but a lot of them yeah. define themselves self-medicating in different areas. You know, yeah. I think about mm -hmm. myself, um, I was born crippled. And so mm -hmm. for me, I'm, I'm a relationship type of guy. And for me, mm -hmm. if a relationship breaks, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. deal with that well. And that was because growing up as a child, because I was a cripple, I loved that people wanted to play with me. I loved the fact that people wanted to be around me. So I didn't even realize that I carried that, even that same um, mentality or symptoms, even until my adulthood. And mm -hmm. so when mm -hmm. I no longer was connected to someone, it hit me hard. It mm -hmm. hit personal. Because when, as a child, when people no longer, you know, when, when, when you got to walk around with crutches and leg braces and, and people hear me talk about that, but that was real. That was a part of my, mm -hmm. my, my childhood. And so mm -hmm. I had to deal with that. And then as a teenager being shot five times and there were anger issues and uh, mm -hmm. how to manage that anger when I wanted to get back, if you understand what I'm saying. One to let back. And now when people would do things, those same emotions and those mm -hmm. feelings would come up. And so mm -hmm. I, I understand the importance of uh, getting assessments or really just talking about it, getting to understand that I even may need an assessment. Because a lot of times, like, it's, like I said, because you accomplish a level of success in life, you feel like I got it together. But in reality, you know there's some areas that you really need to deal with. Mm -hmm. I think also when you talk about that, um, what it makes me think of is sometimes assessments are important too because some people aren't sure why they can't succeed in certain areas. Like so, yeah. they, so they're successful for the most part. Let's say, let's say from others' point of view, you know, you would see someone um, as successful. So, you, so you see me, but there are areas where I know I'm struggling, or you know, a person who's successful knows they're struggling, and they're little they're really frustrated because they can't seem to figure out why. And if you don't figure out why, like, how do I fix that? One of the things that that brought to mind for me is a lot of adults, um, there's an adult variation of ADHD. There are a lot of people with ADHD that don't get diagnosed as a kid, especially generationally. There were, you know, kids for us, there were, I mean, in our generation, kids, um, the teachers just were a little bit more involved and active and did a lot more. So you had a lot less people being called ADHD. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't mean people didn't have it. It meant they were uh, probably less sensitive to it. Um, and now I've noticed and really kind of diagnosed some folks. And I say there's sometimes I feel like I have a touch of it. But there's, the, you know, the inability to really focus on something, to really follow through. Um, it's funny you were talking about successful people don't think they have issues. But there's some areas of success that are actually highly known for for, for instance um, ER, ER physicians there are a lot of ER physicians that are actually known to have ADHD it actually works well yes, for them. Yeah. And, and, and what ends up happening is they don't really know it as a kid or going in or going to medicine but they find that none of the other stuff really works for them because of the follow through and having to do charts and they just don't like but they they can deal with eat with with emergency medicine, so they go into it. Well, it actually works well for them. But we found that a lot of emergency medicine docs are actually ADHD, and that in a, that ability to kind of go from here to here to here to here and on a hundred <laughs> works for them in the emergency room. But it wouldn't work for them like in corporate America, or it wouldn't work for them, say, um, you know. Uh, in um, what do we call it? Um, internal yeah. medicine, where you have a, 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 a patient, you got to follow through on their labs, you got to 
you know, constantly go in and talk. Like they just don't like that long term that, that that doesn't work well for them. So there are certain professions actually that are are, are associated with certain mental um, impairments. And it doesn't mean you can't be successful, but you have to kind of know that I have a limitation in these areas. How do I, you know, what am I supposed to do with those? So we find with ADHD kids or, or adults, you know, you have to really teach them how to organize. They have to organize in a particular way. They have to just do certain things to keep themselves on track. Um, their ability to, to learn and read and study with music on is amazing to me because I can't do that. I can't have music playing while I'm studying, but they're, they need sort of that background music to drown out whatever it is that other attention level that they would go to if they weren't you know if they weren't distracted and it's just very odd but it's just true and so when you were saying you know someone thinks they're successful and they think they don't have any problems because they're successful the truth is your level of success doesn't really um negate the fact that you might have some you know thing, depression comes you know from isolation or for certain types of jobs like military, you know, when you're isolated, when you're overseas, you know, things, you know, people are still going to have um, mental health issues that occur and they can be um, seasonal. Like it just happened that one season while, while this was going on, or it can be that it sort of um, unroofs something from your childhood. I, a lot of people have abandonment issues that they don't really realize they have until they're in a very serious relationship and then that relationship begins to crumble and when that person wants to leave them it triggers something in them that they actually had not identified with um, until now because you know of that whole concept of someone leaving and now they remember or recall because you know a lot of things are suppressed too yes yeah. um they recall when you know their mother you know left them in a store you know just stuff that that have traumatized you you know again so i talked about aces another thing um that triggers people is ptsd right so post-traumatic uh stress um disorder and that comes from all kinds of and that comes that may come from just having you can be a perfectly normal fine person you go into the military and you experience war next thing you know you have you know you have ptsd so that's one of the things that could occur as an adult that you didn't have, you know, as a child. And now you're dealing with this. And that's sometimes hard because that person doesn't even want to admit this is now, this is like altered me as a person. Mm -hmm. And I now have a whole, like a, another foundation from which I have to operate, but I was, I was this and I was that, you know, and so they sort of mourn the person they were prior to this PTSD versus trying to figure out how to um, manage and move through through this this time and then um, sort of enhance themselves to be better. But it can be very difficult once you experience something and then you're labeled and then it depends on what your, uh, what your idea, and we talked about stigmas earlier, what your idea is of mental health or mental illness. Um, that will determine whether you're going to seek help or not. You know, how you see having a mental illness or, or, you know, having some problem. There are a lot of people who just don't want to have that label or don't want to have to seek help because they've been um, uh, self-sufficient for so long. And so they refuse to sort of succumb to the idea that some, they need to speak to someone or, or, or get help from someone. And, and that's the part that um, we have to really kind of work on in, in our communities um, is to really, you know, dispel that that whole understanding that you're weak because you've asked for help. In fact, I think you're strong when you recognize you need help. You know, the and funny thing to that, Doc, was um, within the Blender, I've kind of used that platform to kind of um, mm -hmm. <laughs> deal with a lot of my issues um, because mm -hmm. I would tell things that the average person probably wouldn't say about themselves because I know that that was something that was holding me back. You know, you talk yeah. about seasonal things. And I remember 10 years ago, I told my wife, I said, you know what? I'm dealing with depression. And because I realized every year around a certain time, I would get depressed. I mean, and it would go for like four months. I mean, I'm like, like, stay away. Don't talk to me. Don't come around me. I was just terrible. 
But I realized that it would happen every year around a certain time. So what I did was I had to go back and look at what happened during this time frame that made me uh, turn into this individual, so to say. And it took me back to my son. During the holiday season, when he was a baby was the time we separated. And the pain of that separation, the hurt and the frustration of that separation caused depression. And so every year around that time, I was back into that person. And so mm -hmm. I used in the blender, even with the books that and the things that we're working on now to kind of medicate and to, to um, release that from myself. Because I realized, hey, you, 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 if you're dealing with this, guess what? There are plenty of people that's dealing with the same things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so, oh man, this this is so good to me. <laughs> so let's, let's go to. Did you have anything, sweetie? I'm just good. I'm just okay. This. So so, how is mental health addressed or dealt with differently in various communities? So um, I think kind of what I was alluding to at the end there is um, it just depends on um, how it's been introduced, right? So for instance, in um, let's say non-Black communities, as you know, in white communities, um, you know, there's really not a lot of stigma connected to, you know, having, you know, some depression, having anxiety, have, because having a therapist, which is very interesting, um, you know, I, I, I've been in medicine a long time and having a therapist for white adults or white families is almost a fluke, yeah. <laughs> you know, like the fact that they have, a, you know, a, a physical trainer, uh, um, uh, you know, someone who does their, you know, a masseuse, uh, a therapist, uh, you know, uh, um, someone who, you know, a salon, like they have these people who help them in all these areas. The more people that you're, that you can afford to pay to help you do these different things in your life, really, it's it's kind of connected to how affluent mm -hmm. you are, right? And so there's, I mean, you know, we've watched movies forever where you see the white man or the white woman laying on the, 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 the leather sofa talking to, you know, the therapist about their problems from their mother, you know, everything's blamed on the mother, you know, the mom, <laughs> their mother, their childhood. But the truth is, that was really looked at as not a problem. That's a normal thing. Well, the flip side of that became sort of the stigma for our communities, for Black communities, African American communities. Was you know almost like who has time for that, right? Um, who has time to break down? Who has the money for that? Who has um, you know you you don't you can't afford to be weak. We're walking around with the S's on our chest. We have to carry you know our families and our communities. You know black men can't cry. Black men can't, you know, be um, uh, soft or hurt or, uh, you know, can't be seen as uh, vulnerable in any way. Um, and so, and that's this thing that we've just carried along with us for generations. Um, black women can't break down. You know, we have to be strong for our families. You know, something happens, you don't cry, you keep the sip, you know, and there's all of these things that you learn but that begins to teach you and it teaches your mm -hmm. children, um, either, whether we realize it or not, we're teaching our children that that they can't show emotions and that they can't, um, you know, they have to keep it together. There is no falling apart. Um, and, you know, you have to uh, uh, help yourself. There is, you know, nobody's going to help you do, you know, this, that, and the other. You got to help yourself. And so you tend, we in our communities, we tend not to have these conversations. So, but but here's what's funny: the places that we tend to have them are places like the I'm, I'm or the barbershop, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like those are those have become the the therapists. Not that they really have much to offer as solutions, but what we realize is just yeah. talking about it, just getting yeah. it off your chest, like get your hair, <laughs> uh, you know, massaged and, and shampooed, or why you know, as a man, while you get your hair cut, your beard trimmed. You have these conversations with other folks in the in the barbershop or in the hair salon. Um, that's we've been using those areas as mental health <laughs> um, 
you know, facilities really, but not recognizing that there's a formal way um, of, of, again, going through an assessment, finding out what your symptoms are, finding out what it is that you need help with, and then addressing them and then looking for the progress in those areas so that you can actually eliminate them and, 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 and see change in your life. It doesn't, it isn't helping us to just go somewhere and talk about it um, with others to commiserate versus speaking to a professional to say, this is what I'm experiencing. It's affecting my relationship with my husband. It's affecting my relationship with my children. Uh, it's affecting the productivity, you know, at work. Um, and I'm concerned and this is, you know, you know, what, what should I do? How can I, you know, make some changes? Um, you know, what could this be connected to? And, you know, what, are, what, what can I expect to do different? Like that's, getting to the root of the problem and actually looking for a solution versus commiserating um, with others. So, you know, the communities, it depends on what the communities are and how they sort of address their um, mental health. I think, uh, fortunately, we're beginning to recognize that mental health is a real concern in our, in our community. Um, ACES is a really big um, area that has brought, I think, highlighted a lot of, um, a lot of mental health concerns that really were missed for so long in childhood that have actually affected us as adults. And so it's begun to allow us to accept more that, yeah, depression. So I think one area that we're really good about is postpartum, mm -hmm. right? Postpartum depression doesn't have a color. So we're, 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 we're usually okay with that, but it's very interesting because many Black women, after a certain age of the child is like, okay, you got you to gotta snap out of it. Um, whereas a lot of other communities and cultures realize it can go on for two years, for three years. Many of us just don't realize it. Um, but outside of that, I think we're, we're finally starting to address um, depression. Um, realistically, we're starting to address, um, like I said, ADHD is one of those things that we might be over, over diagnosing in some of our communities and some of our children because um, we're not addressing some of their other needs, but again, um, I just think in the communities, it depends on how it's viewed, um, if there's a stigma or not, whether they're addressing it. And I think we're finally starting to see, you know what, again, we're talking about it now, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. What are some things you should know? What are some things you should be aware of? How can you treat these things? Um, what's normal? What's not normal? Because you know what? You were talking about some things that happened with your son and going through some things and four months of depression or, you know, feeling a certain kind of way. Some stuff is normal, yes. grief, right? You, someone dies and they're really close to you and you can't sleep, you can't eat, you know, you're having a hard time focusing. That's grief. When that goes past six months and a lot of times six months into a year, then it's considered depression. So there are these there are these feelings that we can have that when you have them for a short time, um, they're actually considered within normal variant. But it's after you continue them for um, six months to a year that we actually can diagnose it as um, something that needs to be addressed that might need to be addressed formally. No, that that makes, that makes uh, absolute sense, and it's you know. Again, because it's something so dear to me, you know, I, like I say, I've, I've, you know, pretty much dealt with this pretty much all my life. <laughs> um, but I never really was in a position where I can go to a professional and really talk about things. And so I had to kind of navigate my way. Uh, my wife would tell you, I'll read any and anything, any and everything that I could put my hands on, I'll read it. Because scripture says, and all I get and get understanding. And for me, I want to understand me. Why do I think the way I think? Why do I respond the way I respond? Why do I see things the way I see things? And I will, I will haul off and say something, and my wife look at me like, where did you get that from? Like, what, what was that about? How did you see that? And I would tell her, like, you know, I put myself in people's shoes. You know, because if, if I think of things the way I think of it, I'll never understand people. 
But if I allow myself to put myself in their shoes and look at it from their perspective, now I can understand the choices and decisions they make. And a lot of times, again, that leads back to our childhood, things that we've encountered, mm -hmm. things that we've gone through. And so I wanted, you know, again, to take that opportunity, but it is, is mental health a big problem area for children and young adults? More so than adults? I mean, I, I won't say more so, but it's very prevalent. Um, there I am. So, for instance, and I, I want to write some statistics down and be real clear about it, but um, like, so according to the Department of um, Health and um, Human Services, one in five children experience mental disorder between the ages of one and 11. Um, and one of their other statistics is that 10% of children experience some impairment in their daily functioning. Um, even those who have like normal grades, straight A's, they still, there's about 10% that still have some sort of um, impairment that may be um, unidentified or even misidentified. Um, one of the things I was saying, uh, and so we said one in five, that's 20%, right? Mm -hmm. One in 11, but up to 50%. Um, will have mental illness by age 14. Because like I said, one of the things I was talking about is sometimes as you get older, things will express themselves. Certain things are expressed as young adults like schizophrenia, um, uh, bipolar. They're not, some of those things don't manifest themselves until you become a teen or into your young adult age. Um, another uh, statistic is that 70% of our youth in the juvenile system suffer from some form of mental health. Um, so that's why, for me, it's very important that if we're not diagnosing these things as um, in our younger kids, or if we're not at least sensitive to what's going on, then this is that that whole um, school, you know, that pipeline to prison that we're often talking about, because we're in a lot of these kids are in school systems and communities that aren't, uh, they don't have a lot of resources, they're not identifying their mental health. And so they're looked at as um, bad kids as opposed to there is something called oppositional um, defiance, right? And it's an opposition, oppositional defiance disorder. It is a mental health disorder um, that is recognized in psychiatry that can be um, managed or you know addressed in these different ways. Um, but if you don't recognize it or even look for it, you have no tolerance for it, then these just look like bad kids who, who don't uh, respect authority and um, need to be locked up, you know, need to be locked away. Um, you have, um, and then it's another one, uh, another statistic uh, is 27% of the youth that we're talking about in the juvenile system um, experience disorders that are so severe that their ability to function is significantly impaired. So 70% have something, some sort of something going on. But 27% are like seriously impaired and really should have gotten treatment, um, whether that was um, medi medication, whether it was behavioral or cognitive, you know, behavior, you know, treatment, something that allows them to operate better in, um, in society, right? And in organized, you know, expect expectations. But a lot of times we don't identify it. And so they're just kind of written off. And, um, and I think that's the travesty because once you feel like no one cares, um, then some of the stuff you get into becomes habitual. And then, you, you know, you don't care because they don't care. And then you do end up, you know, in a life of crime and no one ever really took time to really understand where some of your uh, initial um, problems, you know, where they stemmed from. And so, you know, it, it becomes um, unfortunate because whole groups of, of people are then um, labeled as something they probably weren't, um, but now they've become when it comes to crime and, and, and just the legal system, which we already know is, is, uh, is not, not a fair system. Um, <laughs> given even right now, I'm talking about the young man who was, who was gunned down while he was jogging. We already know it's not a fair legal system. So once you get involved in the legal system, it's very difficult to get mental health um, treatment. 
and diagnosis, you, identification, and treatment. And you know, to that point, I think back to uh, growing up, I, I had a cousin uh, who didn't get the proper diagnosis. And mm -hmm. he had some, some serious mental issues that he dealt with. And mm -hmm. I, I can't remember exactly what he did, but he wound up getting locked up. And anyway, when he got locked up, uh, he was young, maybe about 16 years old. They put him in adult prison. He got raped. Mm -hmm. he got raped prison. Yeah, and after that, you know, he told the family what happened. And because his mom brought attention to it, they wound up killing him in prison. But this was somebody who was really a good kid, but had some issues that never got addressed. That's really good kid, really, I mean, as far as respectful, those things, but he had um, issues where he couldn't kind of like mm -hmm. manage his anger, his frustration. So when he got mad, it wasn't, a four or five, it was always 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that 10 landed him in prison, mm -hmm. 16 years old, getting raped uh, six months later because they brought attention to it, got murdered in prison. And mm -hmm. I never forget my mom sitting me down and breaking that down to me. And those mm -hmm. things, things, like you said, growing up that affect you and really uh, put an imprint on your, on your psyche. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you touched that as far as our young people about mm -hmm. the importance of them getting uh, assessments or just getting an understanding of what can be going on with them. Mm -hmm. They're not bad. They're, they're not uh, unruly. There just may be some issues that we need to find out why mm -hmm. they're reacting or responding the way they are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, Absolutely. Mm, um, mm -hmm. This, this is one that was interesting for me. They said there are five stages to this, but what are the five stages of mental illness? So, I mean, I, I saw this question. It might be a little bit different than what what it means. It's not really five stages, but there's five five things that should be sort of highlighted, right? About yeah. mental, about mental illness. Um, so we'll talk about. Um, let me tell you the first one we have. So. You might have, for instance, somebody whose sadness or um, not so, so they're kind of sad about something. I was talking about grief, right? Mm -hmm. And it just lasts longer than expected. When you talk about, like, you know, and when, sometimes when a person's sad, sad has different manifestations, manifestations. So usually what we're talking about is, you're sad, you might cry at the drop of a hat. So you're really teary. Um, every time you sort of think about, um, uh, you, the normal sadness is, I think about the person that I'm grieving or I think about mm -hmm. something that particularly happened. So having a thought about the thing is what makes me sad. What's abnormal for a mental or like a mental illness is that can still be the case but it's longer than six months into a year. And now a lot of people realize when they grieve someone and it's a parent mm -hmm. or, uh, I mean, someone is really close to them, it may, it may feel like, well, it lasted more than a year. But what's, what's abnormal is you just never feel oh, okay. Whereas after that three months, four months, six months, you find yourself, you, you find yourself happy at times unless you think about them, right? Unless mm -hmm. there's something specific that reminds you of them. Um, it's their birthday, Christmas. It's, 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 you know, the holiday. This was a very special day to them. That's still going to happen. And that's going to happen maybe even throughout your lifetime. But a person who's sad so long that they're crying all the time, that they're so, uh, they're so sad that nothing, they don't get joy out of anything. They'd, um, you know, and that's really dangerous. That's why postpartum is dangerous because for a woman who has a child dependent on her and she's so down that the cry of the baby doesn't incite in her the, you know, the motivation to sort of snap out of it and do what she needs to do for the baby. Now that means the baby's in danger of not being fed, not being properly taken care of. Um, not being held 
and, and, and given affection. And that actually affects a child, a baby who doesn't get picked up, who doesn't um, get held, who doesn't get talked to. You know, babies coo at around four months, mostly because they've been talked to. You know, you're saying, you know, what's your name? And God, 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 all of that stuff. That's actually important interaction between mm. a parent or a caregiver and a baby. So that baby begins to sort of say things back and get, begins to talk back, even though they're not really having full words. But that cooing um, is a manner of like exchange. Mm. So if you have a, a parent or caregiver who doesn't touch the baby, who doesn't, you know, won't, um, might change the diaper, but other than that, they put them down. That baby has to cry all the time. That baby learns how to actually stop crying, but they also aren't, um, they don't have normal interaction with people um, as they do grow up. And that, that's actually something we found too. So that's one. So there's a really a, a, a sadness that lasts a lot longer than it's supposed to. Um, that's a lot uh, deeper and it's general. It's not a sadness about a thing or a person or, or an event. It's just very um, sad. Nothing excites them. Nothing gives them joy. Nothing gives them any kind of a feeling. Um, and like I said, that can be dangerous. The other one is an extreme of emotions, right? That high and that low. So a person who I, you'll watch them and within a matter of like 30 minutes, they're like the most, they're happy, everything's great, wonderful in the world. And then they're like, bam, they're depressed. Like, you know, I, you know I, I just, I don't know, life isn't worth living. And you're like, wait, weren't, didn't, weren't you just over here? And so we call that bipolar, right? Mm -hmm. Two opposite ends. You're, you're on one end, you're extremely happy. And, and, and a lot of times that's manic. So they love everything. They love everybody. You know, these are the people who are, they're shopping, they're spending all their money. This is great. And then they're over here. They're extremely uh, depressed and sad and, and wanting to hurt themselves. Um, and often even regretting something that they did when they were manic. So now that's thrown in, into a depression. So that can be, um, that's one of the other, um, phases or things to be concerned about then we have the excessive like fear or worry um like you know i mean to the point not where you're just kind of concerned that things happen but you can't seem to operate because you're so you're so fearful and you're so worried and again that's anxiety so um, there's a normal anxiety where i'm about to take a test <laughs> um i hope i pass I've studied as much as I can. I've done what I can. And the normal anxiety gives me the adrenaline that I need to sort of get through the test. The abnormal um, mental illness that's anxiety is it doesn't matter how much I've studied, what I've you know done, how, how prepared I am, even past this test, I'm still so concerned about I can't sleep, I can't eat, I can't do anything because I'm so worried. I'm always worried. I'm worried about everything. I'm worried about, you know, the lights and the it is everything. Everything worries me, and I can never really kind of turn my my brain off. Um, that's that's the um, anxiety, right? And then we have another um, area is social, uh, like a withdrawal or isolation. You, you're so removed, um, and this is a part of depression, right? But you're so removed that you just, you can't, um, you, you just don't want to be involved with anything, not even your family, your family outings and situations. You can be um, your spouse, you know, you, you don't really want to be around your children, your spouse, you don't want to be around anyone. Um, and you almost begin to create uh, uh, um, these barriers so that nobody else wants to be around you. Kind of like, so hoarding is a little bit like this. A person who does a lot of hoarding, mm. um, they, they can sort of isolate themselves pur purposefully. They get enough stuff around them that nobody really wants to be around them either and they've isolated themselves. Um, and then lastly, you have um, dramatic changes in certain behaviors like eating or sleeping. So both eating and sleeping are also associated with depression. And the funny part is it's either extreme. So some people are depressed and they eat everything in sight. They like eat, 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 because that's the only thing that's keeping them, which is part, sometimes 
when I'm do dealing with um, weight loss, I do have to talk about, well, what is causing it? Is this something that is filling an emotional void for you? Um, are you comfort eating? Is there something that's attached to that for you? I, had a lot of, I have a lot of foster care um, kids that I have to deal with uh, eating disorders because they've associated certain foods with their, with their birth parents. Mm -hmm. They go into foster care and then they're really over consuming. So it's like sugary cereals and or like, you know, every time they go to a different home, they'll ask for just these foods. It reminds them of their birth parents, but they're really over consuming and gorging on you know, certain cereal or Oreos or something that for whatever reason makes them think of their home, their parent. And, um, and a lot of them then become obese while they're in foster care. Um, or it can be the opposite. I'm so depressed that I don't want to eat. Like nothing, um, you know, I might eat a little bit of something here and there just to keep me alive, but I just, I have no joy in eating. There's nothing that I, you know, want and I'm just so depressed I don't want to eat. So with that, it can go either way. The same with sleep. There are people who have insomnia. If they can't sleep at all because their minds are racing and they're just a... Or the person who's so depressed that they're sleeping all the time. Like, you know, they've slept 14 hours and they're just still tired because really they're trying to just block out the world, numb, numb themselves to the world. And they just want to, you know, not be involved and not engage. So, um, so those are sort of the five ways that we, those are the five behaviors that we notice that we'll um, hone in on, whether you're extremely, extremely sad beyond uh, an event that took place, like like I said, six months to a year, whether um, they've had um, these highs and lows that are really dangerous. Sometimes the highs and lows are dangerous highs and lows. Like I said, the low is so low they want to hurt or kill themselves. And the high is manic, maybe drug use or, you know, I mean, they're just all the way up. Um, and like, that's something to be concerned about. And like I said, the, um, the, um, isolation, the withdrawal, the, um, eating or sleeping, and then the excessive fear or worrying, which is the anxiety. I, I was pretty much, I, I think for the most part, I was pretty much that isolation type of person, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like for the first, probably man, seven years of our marriage, I was, I was isolated. I mean, like, literally, like, <laughs> how come home? They'd be like, what's wrong with him? You know, I would go right to the room and close the door. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's like, okay, dude, you got to fix that. You you, you know, you 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 walk past some whole people, <laughs> didn't say a few words, and you went into the room and just mm -hmm. stayed to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, like, like I said, a lot of things I kind of self my, you know, kind of worked out myself because I'm a firm believer that for the most part, we kind of know what we're dealing with. It's a matter of do we want to deal with what we're dealing with? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, but I love this exchange here because even this is ministering to me like, wow, that was you right there. You know, I can go back mm -hmm. in moments of time just from what you're sharing uh, with us on In the Blender and see certain struggles, uh, cert I can identify certain things, certain behaviors, certain patterns that I had and like, oh, okay, now now it's clear. You know, mm -hmm. even like, this is so funny because even to this day, I don't sleep much. I'm a, mm -hmm. My wife will tell you, I probably function maybe off of four hours of sleep a day. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm almost 50. And I've been like that my entire, you know, as far as I know, I've pretty much been that way. I can do mm -hmm. good for, if I do more than five hours, I'm, I'm worse than you probably getting five hours, <laughs> you know, or especially my wife mm -hmm. five hours because she's going to get eight, you no, know. I'm used to, I don't get eight quite no more. Well, yeah, because you're up in the morning yeah. with me as well. But again, you know, so, oh, uh -huh. Time is going. Yeah, six minutes. <laughs> oh my goodness, we only got it, six it's minutes. It's gonna have to be a part two on this. Well, listen, this, guys, we, no way. we're gonna have to get Dr. Yolanda back. Um, I can't say exactly when, but because she's a very, very, very busy young lady, but we're gonna have to get her back 
to finish this out. But listen, if you got any questions that you didn't have an opportunity to type in or you just were thinking about it, you just was writing down some things, kind of looking at yourself, like I was looking at myself while she was talking, shoot it to us where she was. Uh, yeah, email at we are a blended family at gmail.com. Yes, you want to get those questions in because we're going to throw those in um, the next time we get her on. I'm telling you guys, she is, I mean, just <laughs> packed with information. Again, she deals with young people, she deals with older people. I mean, she's kind of across the board. Yes. And so, um, and that's why I wanted her on here. Because she's not just talking from a standpoint of just dealing with adults. Right. She's not just talking about a standpoint of just dealing with children, but she's so she's covering all, all bases. It's all bases. All bases. Because at the end of the day, most things we do as an adult comes from what we did as children or what we yeah. experienced as children. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's important to understand these things. Listen, guys, I want to just applaud Dr. Yolanda for joining us on tonight. Thank you, guys. It's been a blessing. Listen, yes. we have to get her back either next Tuesday or Tuesday after next. We'll definitely have her back on before the month of May is out. You yeah, we can us and let us know your schedule so we can book you so we can finish this all. Yes. Okay. There are ways to go on. on yes. This. Yes. <laughs> we, we, got a, we got a little bit way to go. And I'm telling you guys, listen. If you if you got a family if if you're dealing with some some issues or, or you have a family member that's dealing with some issues, share this episode. Absolutely. Share this broadcast, Dr. Yolanda. How how can they reach you? Yes. Um. So sure, I have. Um. So they can email me at info at drylandamd.com. Um. That's my email address. Um. My website is drylandamd.com uh, as well. So. Um, I can be reached because they can do, there's a chat box there that comes to me as well. So either my email or my website um, and ask me questions. And like I said, I'd be happy to, uh, I can hold on to them and, and answer them next week or well, probably in two weeks. Okay. Um, I can hold on to them there or um, if it's something specific, I can just email them right back. But info at drylandamd.com is my um, email address. And listen, guys, also, too, I'm going to have to get her back uh, soon to talk about this weight loss. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I'm telling you guys, she the bomb. When it, when that, I mean, she's assisted me. Uh, we got to get back because I got another goal I got to get back to. And so we're going to work on that. But uh, um, look, a lot of people doing COVID got some goals. They go <laughs> Exactly. They've been home and they've been. <laughs> and, um, a lot of people hit me up, especially from SOFCC. So I know this is a real thing. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So we're going to talk about that. I, I want to introduce those that play a valuable role, even in my weight loss. Because it's important to understand, guys, this is a community effort. I didn't just reach this by myself. I have specific people that play specific roles so that I so that I can get a specific result. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I want to introduce my my team, the people that are part of my team that help me get to where I am now, and even even beyond where I am now, but where I was. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. You guys are going to enjoy that. But listen, we're out of time. Um, so on Thursday, you'll be able to um, listen to this replay, um, download the app, tune in, and we'll be on from 8 to 9 p.m. And make sure when you download that app, um, add WJMS as a favorite. Also, now you can catch In the Blender on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud. Uh, we're pretty much on all the different um platforms now and you can hear us at any time so make sure you download all those apps also our email is we are a blended family at gmail.com and our website is in the blender ministries.com so you guys hear that itunes stitchers now SoundCloud. we're out there guys listen tune in check us out I mean, hit us up. We want to take this thing worldwide. I mean, it's already worldwide, but we want to have that impact um, that we're just not here 
um, but we're impacting the world at large. Thank and so you. again, we thank you, Dr. Yolanda, for thank you. So just so much. We thank you for all the wealth of information that you shared with us on tonight. Uh, do, do you got your book with you? Um, oh, I do. So here's the um, journal. No, I'm in my office. Hold on. <laughs> That's funny. I should have had it ready. Yeah, you know, I'm going to plug you. I know. I, so I have um, soul food therapy. Um, it's uh, how savory. So it says for savory, organic, unprocessed living foods. And it's how uh, savory, organic, unprocessed living food saves lives. So this is Soul Food Therapy, and this is the Soul Food Therapy Journal. So, um, yeah, you can go to my website, or you can go, I have a, a nutrition blog, which is body.pro.com, where you can also, also get the books. Um, I have a couple of books on there, and children's nutrition book as well. So, um, yeah, I appreciate it. But, yep, yeah. um, Soul Food, it's also on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. And listen, have that ready for us the next time we're on. Yes. Because we want to make sure that we get that information out. Because at the end of the day, that's a part of mental health. Absolutely. That's a part of being aware. Everything that she's going to share, those books, those journals, all of those are part of mental health awareness. And so, again, we thank you. We love you. We appreciate you so much. Listen, guys, thank you. You make sure to tune in to In the Blender with Brandon and Madden Hyman, our special guest, Dr. Yolanda Lewis Raglan. And I'm telling you guys, I enjoy myself. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. All right, guys. Bye.